Thank you very much. I, I am on 11 right now. One, I've had caffeine and I normally don't. Two, I am so excited for the show that we are about to offer you all today. It's the remix episode and it's featuring a good friend of mine, someone who I think is one of the most talented DJs in the world. His name is Mike Realm. Um, before we get into the show, I got to uh, actually, I want to end a contest that's been going on for the last couple of days since. Uh, Gosh, what was it, like Tuesday or Friday that I announced the contest. If you retweeted and drove people to the blog post. Oh, sorry guys. Yikes. It's printing and it's making noise, sorry. Um, if I, would, I was driving people to the blog post and if you cleverly retweeted something, then I was gonna give you a Polaroid Z340 camera. And the winner of that tweet, which the, we, we laughed about this quite a bit and whether or not to select this one, but the ladies in the bunch won out and they said, the winning quote is from Paul Barros, or at Paul Barros, hey Chase Jarvis, I'm pregnant and the baby is yours, so the least you can do is give me the Polaroid Z340. He's a man, so it's not true, but, <laughs> but Paul, that, for being a bold quoter like that, um, it's all you, you get the Polaroid Z340, so thank you very much. Also want to thank Braun Color, um, gosh, Polaroid and b &H for supporting the show. Now onto the good stuff, my good friends. It brings me great pleasure to introduce none other than the amazing, talented Mike Realm. Bring it on, buddy. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Make yourself comfortable. We have champagne and orange juice, coffee, water wow. at, your, at your fingertips. Lovely. Um, this will put my bladder to the test. Yes. I actually had to go one time in the middle of the show. I had to leave. So the guest just held down the, 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 uh, the couches here for <laughs> a second. Jokes. Um, okay, so we've been talking about the remix. And you, as a DJ, are, I think, most classically um, embroiled in the remix culture. But one of the things that I want to do in this show is show how the remix is everywhere around us. We talked a lot about it at dinner. I was talking to the, to the audience before we started broadcasting live about how even our cocktails were very were actually remixes of yeah. previous cocktails. Drinks. Yeah, drinks, um, uh, fashion, a lot of that. You know, basically, it's everywhere around us. So why don't you start off the show by telling me a little bit so that the audience who's not familiar with you and your work, like, how'd you get your start? What are you doing now? Who are you? What do you do? Uh, well, I started out, like I said, as a DJ and as a hip-hop DJ. So by nature, we sample. Because in, when, when hip-hop first started, there, wasn't, there weren't hip-hop musicians to back up the rappers. They just sampled disco tracks and looped them and, and rapped over that and made songs. Um, so w when you're doing a party, you're taking songs and, and mixing them for a party. Normally, you know, you think it, it, it's just, oh, just play some songs and you're all good. Like, yet, it's not really like that. There's an art to it to keep the flow. You know, there, there's, there's tempos and, and keys you got to think about. Um, so, so from the, at your core, you're a DJ, right? From like, yes, that's your background. That is like, DJ. it's in my blood. I can't look at things. And that's probably what helped me with the video element of the remix is I'm, I'm watching things, I'm listening to things, um, and, and, I'm, and I'm looking at them as, as samples, things that I can, I can kind of uh, take and, and, and do something cool with. Yeah, so still, you got, you got still images, you got video images, mm -hmm. and audio, and that yes. sort of grew out of just being a DJ. One of the things we talked about at dinner last night, which actually, um, I'm going to pull up a quote here for a second. Um, T.S. Eliot, admirable gentleman, right? Andy, you like T.S. Eliot? One of the surest tests of the superiority or inferiority of a poet is the way in which a poet borrows. Immature poets imitate, mature poets steal, or Sorry, mature poets steal. Bad poets deface what they take. Good poets make it into something better or at least something different. And if I'm not mistaken, over dinner last night, you said that, that in and of itself was a driving force in getting you to do something that no one else is doing, right? I mean, or that very few people are doing. 
Yeah, it's keeping, I mean, there's, you can, it's so open, you can do whatever you want with it. Um, my approach is I, I take things that I like. Okay. So that helps me in, A, when I'm sitting down for a few days working on something, I'm not, you know, on suicide watch. <laughs> but um, also, you, when you put something out, you, the things live forever now on the internet. So if you do something crappy that you're really not into, but you're doing it just because you want the views or whatever, you could get 80 million views on something and... A cat video, for example. Yeah, and right. you gotta live with that. You're the cat video guy. <laughs> and uh, if that's your thing, cool. But um, there's other ways to go about it and to keep the integrity of the source material. Got it. Um, like when I, when I look at a, a, a movie trailer, it's so, you know, something like, like, like when I saw Iron Man, the Iron Man 2 trailer, I was like, oh my God. I can't stop watching this. I I, I got to do something with it. You know, it was and the idea, that, what, and then you would take something and with a goal of making it better, based on that T. S. Eliot quote. T. S. Eliot quote. Yeah. So, or, 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 thank you for the coffee. So let let's go back just a little bit. I'm getting ahead of myself. So, I think the first lesson that if I'm going to talk about basically the remix culture is there's a lot of meta stuff going on, you guys and gals. And so I'm going to ask for questions throughout the course of the show from you. And if you folks at home, or I don't know what camera's live right now, but you folks at home, we're taking questions at hashtag CJ Live. And it's also the kickoff of another contest right now that if you have anything that you like, that you want to share with your friends in your social network, if you retweet the URL to this live page right here, or short URL, if you say that quote that either Mike or I say is probably Mike, because he's the smarter of the two of us up here, probably say a bunch of smart stuff, and hashtag CJ Live, then we are going to give away another Polaroid uh, Z340 and assign one of a kind Polaroid that I will shoot at Mike after the show. So two more giveaways to keep pimping the show if you can, share it with your, with your network, um, quotes that you like from the show. Anything else also? Yep, I just nailed that. Okay. Um, so. There's a lot of meta stuff going on. And I expect a lot of the questions coming in at hashtag CJ Live on Twitter and from you guys to understand or to reference this probably. Even what it is that you do for a living is sort of a remix. Because if I'm not mistaken, mistaken you, there's not a lot of video, video uh, DJs out there. There's a lot of audio DJs and most of them either are on the radio or are spinning weddings, and they, they make great money too, but, sure, yeah. but you're neither of those things, and you're, yet you're, you've got a sort of a video editor component, so you yourself are a mashup of things that traditionally didn't exist prior to you, to you doing what you do. So, so can you tell me, walk me down that path of how you arrived at what you are today? Um, film was always in the back of my head when I was growing up, like I, I, I wanna do that, you know, I'll DJ to, also, I wasn't getting invited to any parties when I was in high school. So the, the way, like literally the way in was to be the DJ. Because the other guys were goofing off and, you know. Drinking beer. Drinking beer and, and having girlfriends and stuff. I'm like, yeah, I want to be a part of the club too. Uh, they didn't have a, a DJ and, and it was a very technical thing. So, you know, you had to like spend a lot of time on it and spend, you know, get a job to buy records and, and the equipment. So I went through that. Um, so I can, I can be the, the guy kind of controlling the party. It felt, it felt very empowering to me. Interesting. Um, and I'll say, I'll, I'll do that until, until college and I'll study film. Then, I'll, then that's, that's that. But I started getting more gigs and I, and I started entering these, these contests and, and I got to do shows outside of California. I grew up in San Francisco and I was like, oh, this is interesting. Like there's a, there's a thing. I don't have to be, you know, like you said, like a, like a radio guy or a, a wedding guy or a club guy. There's other things out there. Um, and, I, and I took it more as a performance art, you know, because I was, I was scratching a lot and stuff. But and what, so one of the things that I feel like I am a hybrid of a lot of things as well, and if someone asked me at a party, it's really I'm a photographer, but mm -hmm. in my head I'm like, oh God, you know, it's really, I wish I could share some of the other things, but it's just too complicated or whatever. And I assume it was the same thing with you. Like you call yourself a DJ, right? Or do you call yourself a performer? Like what do you call yourself? Uh, it's, it, it's been more of a performer these days Got or it. just kind of, kind of a, uh, an artist. Because it's so hard to be like, oh, I DJ. But then I do these video things, and I'm directing these music videos and shorts. And, and so 
Uh, it's yeah, just to say artist is like it's the easy right um, all in. So so that's one thing that uh, is a takeaway for the folks at home and for you folks here in the live audience. I think is that the fact that what it is that you want to do doesn't exist is not a good reason for not doing something. And it really, if you kind of unwind what Mike's talking about, the the uh, the experience is one where he you literally just pursued your passion. You had a love for film. You liked playing music, and you wanted to get into the parties. Which those are all fine motivators to do something, but. The fact that, like you said over lunch yesterday, if I'm not mistaken, also, if I would have told myself, my 10, year, 10 years ago self, what it is that <laughs> I'd be doing today, my 10, years old, my 10 years ago self wouldn't have understood that this even was possible. Yeah, my right? head would have exploded. <laughs> because back then, I mean, like, I'm able to, to scratch video, like, just like you're scratching a, a, a song on a record. You're using records to control, I'm scratching QuickTime files, basically. If someone told me that, I'd be like, wait, first of all, what's a QuickTime file? Second of all, like, this is crazy. <laughs> this is science fiction, right? right. So the first, I mean, this is like five years ago when, when, when the technology started happening. And I was like, oh my god, I know exactly what I'm going to do with this. Because I've been dreaming of this, like, you know, just as a, it was just a, a, a weird thought that like, you know, maybe one day we'll scratch videos. Yeah, right. Like, yeah. no, that, that actually happened. And that's how you time. make your living now in part. And yeah. for those of you that are watching at home and for the lucky 30 people that are in this room, you're going to get to see a live performance at the end of the show today. Mike is going to unload. And I got to watch him practice last night and this morning. And that's why there's my hair is a mess right here because my head was on <laughs> fire. It was pretty amazing. So we're going to get to see some of the stuff that he's actually talking about, which is going to be like the highlight of the show. But again, we're already at a couple, uh, we've hit, hit a couple of uh, markers already in the show, which is the, the, there are a million paths these days that weren't available for us as artists, for we as artists, that, you know, that, that didn't exist just a couple of years ago. And foraging your own path through is, I think, one of the most, the most important takeaways in modern pop culture. That's whether you're a DJ, whether you're a photographer, a filmmaker, what is it that you're doing new? What two things are you combining? So, you know, we talked about the remix and that it's everywhere. We talked about cocktails, but it's even in the path, the career path that you chose. I mean, Andy, what you, you've got, uh, what do you, how do you, there's a DJ here, DJ Scientific American, and maybe is there a mic that we can give to Andy? I don't know. Um, but what do you, like, how do you, con what do you consider uh, your path through this? Let, let me give you a mic. Hang on just one second here. Hello. Uh, I say composer and stuff. <laughs> right. <laughs> Design. Right. So your job, your Build, life, your, yeah. your, your, your um, existence, how you get paid is a remix in and of itself, right? So you're a yes. composer. Really. So you mix music. You, you make music for, for film scores and for commercials and whatnot. Yeah. And, and what else? And even, even half of that is remixes. So Ooh, that's triple meta. Right? Hey, <laughs> you worked on this video game. You wrote the score. Well, no. I remixed other people's music for the score. Got it. So, yeah. But see, that's, I love that. And I'm sure there are lots of other folks in the audience um, that have a, a similar tact. So I think that's a major, major takeaway, is if you're going to do something original, also, it's going to be hard. You can't describe what it is you do, which you told your whole life. And if you can't put it in an elevator pitch, you're not going to be successful. I call bullshit on that because there's a living example of it right here. And, and Andy, you're also an, an incredibly um, relevant living example here. And, and I, I would think even that I'm a photographer and a director, an artist, an entrepreneur, like those things, they all don't go together very well either. So, um, well, one of the other themes that we were talking about, and I'm going to go to my, um, go to my uh, set of quotes here, Larry Lessig. So I don't know if you know Larry Lessig. Um, he's a professor, law professor at Stanford. He's a friend of mine. And as I said earlier, we're going to try and get him on a, a future show here. He wrote a book called Remix. And from the back of the book, or somewhere in and around the book, maybe the marketing materials, for more than a decade, we've been waging a war on our kids in the name of the 20th century model of copyright law. In this, the last, his book about copyrights, Larry Lessig maps both the way back to the 19th century and to the promise of the 21st. Our past teaches about the value in remix. He says, we need to relearn this lesson, that the present teaches us about the potential of a new hybrid economy, one where commercial entities leverage the value from sharing economies. 
the future will benefit both commerce and community. If the lawyers can get out of the way, it could be a future we could celebrate. Damn. Thank you, Dr. Lessig. So why don't you riff on that for me for just a second? Because that pretty much, that sums up your career path, right? Like you, yeah, you started out just making stuff in your garage and then lo and behold, people started calling. So play that out for us. Yeah, um, I, I guess the, the, a good example would be when I did the Iron Man uh, remix, I, I saw it, I watched it all day, ripped it off of, I think I got it from Apple trailers or something. Um, and so you my stole own thing. it. I completely stole it, yeah. <laughs> Normally guilty, you say no, no. Guilty. guilty as charged. Okay. So I, I put that up on YouTube. You know, I made, I made my own music for it and everything. Um, because to me, uh, I'm so, just coming from that world of, of like mixtapes and DJs, um, we were all scared about uh, music copyright. I wasn't even thinking about video. I, it didn't even occur to me that it would be an issue. Um, so I put it up and, and that Friday, John Favreau hits me up on Twitter. Okay, so you guys know who John Favreau is? <laughs> John Favreau is the director of Iron Man. So yeah. you, when it's you, his baby. Yeah, <laughs> when, so when, you, when your phone rings and you probably, it doesn't say John Favreau because you don't have him in your, <laughs> in your, in your, in your, uh, in your contact list, but it says this number, do you answer? He, said, he says, so hey Mike, this is John Favreau. And what yeah, he, says, I, I, he really liked the remix. He took it to Paramount and said, we, you know, I, I want to do something with this because um, uh, it, it's cool. So we worked it out where I, I did a, a, a television spot in that style. Okay. So, it so let totally me, let me, let me tell this story for the people who are doubting or are, who, who are frustrated or maybe don't understand. So you stole the thing. Like a car. <laughs> like a car. Like you stole a car. This car. Okay, you stole the car. Stole the car. You brought it in the shop. You, you, you put nitrous on it. I pimped it out. You pimped it out. You lowered that shit. You put nitrous in it. You tinted the windows. And then put the guy YouTube. called and said, he didn't actually call it, and then you put it up, then you, you, know, you drove it around the block, yeah, yeah. and the guy whose car it was collapsed. saw it and said, hey, thank you so much, can you, can you, um, can I use that? <laughs> can, can I use that, basically? Yeah. Can I use can the we make car? a bigger version of that right. now? Right, can, yeah, can we make multiple? So that's really how it went down, right? Yeah, exactly What do you think it about down. it? What do you think about it, or anyone in the audience, what do you all think about how that went down? Is that, is he stealing? I mean, so what, where's this, you know, the, the, the intersection of what uh, Larry Lessig was just talking about, about commercialism using communities to share, and the T.S. Eliot quote about Mike took something and made it better. So is this legitimate now? I mean, because copyright law says it's not. For like, straight up, it says it's not. But you made it better, and then something else happened, which, why don't you tell us what happened next? You got paid. Yeah, that's, that's another cool <laughs> thing about it, <laughs> right? <laughs> On top of that. Um, but you know, I, I think a lot of it is, is in, the, it's in the eye of the beholder. I mean, like, he could have been a jerk and been like, nope, that's my thing, take it down, you're going to jail. Um, but what was it about what you did? And when we were just talking, it was, it was like there was, some, there was an intent coefficient, there's a yes. benevolence, a respect, like, what, talk about that. I, I do believe it, it, was, it was a respect thing because I, I have a lot of respect for it. Um, and, I, and I wanted to keep the integrity of it. I wasn't like, you know, putting my face on top of, you know, um, Robert Downey Jr.'s head or whatever and like making a joke of it. Like I was really trying to make something uh, cool in, you know, in my eyes and keep the integrity of, of the source material. And you obviously he felt that you did, right? He, mm -hmm. he, in the true spirit of the T.S. Eliot quote that I opened with, he thought that you had taken his thing and made it better in some way, more interesting or different. Or different something enough, that was gonna, yeah. yeah. Maybe better is not the right word. Maybe it's just different. Mm -hmm. uh, and and so you added value in some way, and that made him want to participate in it. Yeah. Okay. So you did that for years and years before John Favreau called. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Talk about well, no the early watching. years, the dark years. <laughs> Talk about the dark years the where maybe some of our some of our um, friends at, at home. Um, or in our studio audience are, are right now, and they're like, gosh, how do sure. I get to what Mike's doing? Or photographically, or with film, or with any, any medium. Mm -hmm. That's, um, that was a tough place to be, not only because it, I didn't have a career doing that, but because it's so hard to like take an idea that doesn't have a path. It's not like I can say, oh, okay, well that guy did this, and he, all he did was do, you know, he uploaded to YouTube, da 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 da, and that happened. Like, I didn't, there wasn't that. So that was kind of scary. And it, was, it can be discouraging because you're sitting there like, 
what do I do? Like, okay, so you this know? is this is the idea we've talked about on the show before, where when you have no constraints, that's you think artists think that they want no constraints, but as soon as you are given no constraints, you're like, you're like, wow, I'm gonna go walk the dog again. <laughs> I need some more. I need some more ideas. <laughs> Maybe coffee will help. Right. You know. Yeah. And you, yeah. You walk the neighborhood a couple times. And yeah, and nothing happens. Got it. But so you, you impose some constraints on yourself, and one of those is producing a lot of material. Right? Mm -hmm. Just 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 make it and and put it out. See what happens. And you know if 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 you and and your friends watch it and that's it and you don't like it, you can take it down. And and you know it's like one of those. It's it's like the uh, if a tree falls in the forest, does it really make a sound? Like technically it does, but emotionally it. It doesn't do anything. And so there was a year. There were years where you weren't making any noise, but you were still doing what it is that you do now. You were ripping off other people's stuff. You were Stealing. reshaping it. Yep. No, no. And I'm Completely. saying because that's what it is. Yeah. But again, that's I'm trying to break through this concept that the remix is somehow evil. Because here's an example of someone who's taking other people's stuff, their intellectual property, but because he has intent of doing something better, because there is a respect for the material. And initially, you're practicing with this other material, right? Whether you're doing Photoshop or cutting a new era of, mm -hmm. uh, piece of a film, or in your case, doing like the, the Iron Man remix that you did, you're attempting to add value. And there's another point at the end of your videos, you often drive people to, like, don't you say, like, hey, man, thanks a lot. I'm yes. a big fan of the. Yeah, so I always point people back to the original trailer to say, watch this, the movie's coming out, whenever it's coming out. So uh, it looks like we, we're, we're starting to get some rough guidelines for how to do this in a way that sort of encourages it. And you know, just this last week, someone, a photographer in the UK, um, took my pictures and Jeremy Coward's pictures and made a website out of them and said that they were his. And that, that was sort of weird. That was sort of weird. And you know, the, community, the community found out about it, pointed, it, pointed them to it. And you know, he was, I think it was the lesson learned. But the thing that upset me not was that, not that my pictures were somewhere else, but that it was representing the exact work as his own. And in, you know, in a different, say maybe a different occurrence, if someone had taken something and remixed it, so maybe I'm encouraging someone to remix something that I've, that I've done out there right now. And again, if you, if you follow these guidelines that were sort of that Mike is doing a really good job of laying out for us, that could be something of flattery and of respect and of, wow, that's so cool that you, that you did something to improve this or to help share it or to create some virality to it, which is what you've done. We've got a question mm -hmm. back there. Scott in the audience? Yeah, yeah um, take that, take that mic. So Scott, you're from the University of Washington, right? Yeah, local uh, hip hop artist Gabriel Teodros has this great line, it ain't what you got, it's how you freak it, right? So it's that <laughs> freak it phrase. In our digital media program, we talk a lot about creation and curation. It seems to me what you're talking about is that combination of creation and curation with the extra added spice or secret sauce, which is your intent. What is that secret sauce or flip it quote? How, how do you know you've actually, you know, you're not just taking something to do what Chase just said and put it on and passing it off on your own, but there's, you're adding that flip to it. I love the, I love the freaking the, it. That you're freaking it. Freaking I'm having it. A guy, let's, adding the blip is not near as cool as freaking it. Okay, so, how, so do you what mean from is a creative the, standpoint? Or yeah. like when do you kind of know it's ready? Or, I mean, yeah, Scott, I think when you're talking about freaking, like you're trying to add something dynamic and, and interesting to it, right? Is that the freak? Sure. Own Could be your own voice okay. or your own style. So I, talk about that for a second. Mike. I feel like my, my own, what separates my work from someone else's remixes uh, would be the music. Because I'm creating it myself and uh, not that other guys can't create their own music, but um, that to me, because that is the, the, uh, the non-ripped element, right. um, that's kind of the, the baseline for it. So that's a, that's a benefit that you bring to the table, so to yeah, speak. That's exactly. his mojo, that's his freak, is that I'm going to take your visuals and I'm going to remix them and I'm going to put music on top mm -hmm. of that. Would you say you did that with the, uh, with the Iron Man remix? I mean... I did, and then I, and then I used the, uh, the Black Sabbath thing at the end. But most of it was mine. Cool, you know? cool. I just couldn't I don't know resist. If, maybe, I think we have that queued up at some point. Maybe, uh, D'Artagnan, give me a wave if you're, if you're cool to, uh, to do that. So, we're going to do right now, we're going to watch Mike Realms remix the one that Jon Favreau commissioned him to do for the broadcast commercial for Iron Man 2. Is that right? Yes. Iron, Iron Man, Man 2. 2. Take it away. I am Iron Man. I, 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 I am Iron Man. You can't. You can't. 
That's okay. serious business. So that's a great example of uh, a freaking it, if you will, to, to pick up Scott from University of Washington's uh, earlier point, that you're adding, you added a, an incredible amount of depth and Favreau called you and, and now you've got this sweet commercial. Sweet. So I'm gonna unwind us just a little bit and go back to something that I, a note that I had made earlier, if I can pull that up. Okay, it was in part the title of the show, but I'm gonna go back a little bit further because that was a remixed version. The title of the show was uh, Talent Imitates, but what it really came from a Picasso quote, which was good artists copy, great artists steal. So you're a great artist, by definition, <laughs> what we just saw right there. It's totally stealing. But, so what about the, the good artists copying? Like that's sort of like a wah wah, and, mm -hmm. and, and talk to me about how, uh, like a whack version of what it is that, it, that what you would have made that was, say, disrespectful or in poor taste or not. I'm copying you and I'm pretending that you didn't do it because when you rip somebody off, you're sort of paying tribute, right? Right. So talk about what, what would some, uh, some examples of doing this in a whack methodology that wasn't respectful and, say, was just a good artist copying. Want me to name names? No, um, <laughs> <laughs> Whew, the internet probably doesn't want that. Yeah, neither do they. Um, so. You know, I don't know, because for me, I always had that, like, like just kind of growing up in, in hip hop, it's like, do not, don't be a biter. Don't rip somebody off like that. That's just, what's the point of that? It okay, so for the folks at home who are confused, this is the guy saying, don't rip somebody off, right? Oh, yeah, the so, term no, this is yeah, interesting. <laughs> no, but this is really, really, and this is why I'm, tr I'm trying to say that it's actually okay that it can be both ways, because He's saying, don't rip somebody off, don't be a biter. That comes out of hip hop culture. And hip hop culture says, if you're just gonna pull somebody's moves, mm -hmm. either dance moves and break dancing, or they're scratching, or whatever, sure. their particular style, then, and you're trying to represent it as your own, that's whack. That's just being a good artist who's yeah. imitating, rather yeah. than a great artist who's stealing. So a great artist, right. by contrast, would be an example of what you've just done with, with uh, the Favreau Iron Man piece. So, is there any questions about that? Because I think that's a natural point of concern. Like, there's a lot of people, <laughs> I see some it questions. It can be very like, confusing. Oh, yeah. shit. <laughs> so, what do we have? Yeah, let's make, make sure you got the, the mic there. What comes to mind for me is, is back in the 80s, Aerosmith was kind of down in the slumps. They weren't doing so well. Run DMC totally jump started their career again by having them pay tribute to mm -hmm. their inspiration. So if you're gonna rip somebody off, it sounds like what you're saying is at least give the artist you're your ripping off the credit. And, and, and it, yeah, but, and they, they might actually like it. Like, right. I hope that someone does something with some of my material and sends it to me and then I like it, because then I'll share it and maybe I'll collaborate with them, maybe, you know? As long as they're not out there saying, I did this, and these are my pictures. <laughs> right. You know, like, like that's, there, there's a fine line right there, which that's pop culture, that's why I have this episode because it's so, it's everywhere in pop culture. We, I don't think we need to figure it out from a legal perspective, but we have to understand kind of mano a mano what we mean, what's the threshold. So, sorry, I sort of interrupted you. You wanna keep talking? No, no, I just, I guess imitation is the best form of flattery as long as you're giving credit. Right, as long as it's good and as long as it's respectful, mm -hmm. right? I think those are also great points. And there's a, um, you know, basically, let's, let's, if we can talk about the history of the remix, unless you've got something. Yeah, you yeah. Want to no, add I wanted to talk about the, the Run DMC thing. Dude, I yeah, think please that's please a great do. example. Um, but I, I wouldn't call that ripping off because they, they, they turned it into something else. They turned it into a You know what I mean? They didn't, they didn't re, it wasn't like Run DMC's new song, and then it's like, well, that's Aerosmith's song. But they, they, they used it in the way that uh, Sugar Hill Gang used. Uh, disco loops and stuff, just to to because that was their music. Right, that and they was wrapped their, on top. Yeah, that yeah. was their style of doing it. Mm -hmm. They made a new song out of it. So, yeah, let, let me go back just for a second, a little history. So, my understanding, uh, and I'm a pop culture junkie, and I could have this wrong, but a lot of this, like the remix, really came out of Jamaica and mm -hmm. reggae and and dub worlds, where they were removing material and putting their own. Uh, stuff over the top of it, like stripping down a track down to just its baseline, and then were, they were, say, rapping over it or or singing over it in their own method. Mm -hmm. And then that was like super early, and then it sort of went into like, um, uh, I guess the, maybe the best example of the next iteration. And there's, you know, that's where when the Sugar Hill Gang was really doing their stuff, Grandmaster Flash and the Furious mm -hmm. Five, were, they were sampling and, and again rapping over the top of some of these 
these Rick James and stuff in the background. Yeah. But then my understanding is that like Art of Noise was a band that was completely made of sample material. Mm -hmm. How did, you know, like talk to me about that. I feel like, you know, we're back to the, to the Jamaican, um, the roots. Yeah, that it, that I think a lot of it comes out of limitations because I want I I want to make something. What I'm doing is like with my movie trailer remixes is it's not for me. It's not so much um, I want to take other people's stuff and, and mix it up and, and and be and be cute about it. I that's my editing style. That's like my creation style. I just don't have the budget to to blow things up and, and make cool things like that. Um, and I think for, the, for them also, you know, they didn't have, there's no, they didn't have uh, the money to make mute. They didn't have money to go to the studio or whatever. So they took a recorder, said, all right, well, there's music here. Yeah, it's coming on the radio. I'm gonna yeah, record it. Yeah, great. Um, so I, I think a lot of lo the remix culture, for at least for, from where I, see it. it a lot of it comes from limitations got it and that's to go back to the thing i was talking about earlier limitations end up being a great driving creative force those are the most powerful moments for me when i'm given a set of constraints you have to take these kinds of pictures or shoot this kind of film but you can't mm -hmm. do it here you can't do this with, you only have this much money you only have this kind of equipment go yeah and and that ends up being incredibly rich and rewarding and that's you know necessity is the mother of invention right that's probably as you said what helped the the jamaican underground really create something new and original called the remix uh, was out of constraints, like creative constraints, lack of money, times, there's no, there's no music studios, mm -hmm. or there's yeah. very, Just very limited, get it done, limited access, got it. And then in the modern era, I feel like if we're gonna trace this, it's sort of, remix is just a, a term that is, I think, the most well understood. Mashup sort of came along in the 90-somethings and mm -hmm. was a, it was, an, it was an adequate definition of it, but that's really more of what's going on now. I think you've, you've got a, a uh, just a confluence of all sorts of different media, not too dissimilar to yours. It's not just like you're remixing a sound, because that was really, remixing was really part of audio. It was engineering, yeah. yeah. It was musical engineering. And then the, the mashup, that started including multimedia, mm -hmm. visuals, um, laying multiple tracks and, and whatnot. So, did, did I get my history right here? It's like a synthesis of all of the, the predecessors is, the where, is where we're at right now. Exactly. Okay, so let's, speaking of where we're at right now, I want to remind you folks at home uh, that we are taking questions at hashtag CJ Live, and I want you all folks out there in the audience to come up and raise your hand if you got something to say. While I run through a few statistics that I picked up on the entertainment consumer spending. So, if you remember, the music folks said our world is crashing and burning, um, and they said that about video games because they were being ripped and proliferated. They said about music, about books, and, and film and video. So um, I think I, I've got some numbers here that, that uh, let's just talk about video games for uh, as an example. Worldwide video game industry um, is, uh, God, it's four times greater since the year 2000. Now, there's, this is not exclusively because of the remix. I understand that. But is our culture dying? Are the economies, these, that, that are the economies that drive these pursuits being undercut? Well, this says it's grown four times. Um, number of tracks cataloged. In uh, 1949, there was somewhere down just a couple million in, um, in music. And in 2010, there was over 100 million tracks categorized. And if you look at that on a curve, which is what I'm looking at right now, it goes... It's a complete hockey stick. So a lot of that comes, I think, in your example of not being able to make music, but going out and finding other music and making music with those raw building blocks. Um, book revenues. During the biggest recession in the last 70 years, book publishing revenues grew by 5.6%. Now, I know a lot of publishers, and they're scratching their head trying to find out how to be relevant, but that's because there are so many players in the field and because the bar for entry has been lowered, it has been lowered, what some people argue because we're cheating, we can just get in there and make it. I was at a conference just last weekend where that was a big topic. People are cheating. Um, but again, what I'm trying to do is defunct that. It's just to call it what it is, which is, I think, bullshit. And then global TV and film spending is up from um, in 2008 to, uh, oh, sorry, from 2001 to 2008, it's over 300 billion. So it's increased 100 billion in the last 10 years. 
That's B, 100 with a B billion. So the idea that these cultures and these creative industries are somehow getting their ass handed to them is, is wrong. Now, I think what I'm understanding the, the chief players are doing is waving their hands admittedly because it's harder and harder to make income. And I take this from a photographer standpoint, now that you know, the cameras are so great and they're so affordable, the fact that you used to have to have a, a $100,000 cine camera to get this great short depth of field look when the D90 came out a few years ago, first camera that allowed you to do that for $1,000. So I think you know, that, that money went out of those giant broadcast cameras and into mm -hmm. maybe Nikon or Canon's hands. Um, and so that's what we're hearing about. But the irony is that the numbers overall are growing. So what do we feel about that out in the audience? You've got an opinion. I know you do. Yes, you do. Wait, let's let's give, it, give the mic a pass around there. Who's got an opinion in the audience? I think it's great. You know, you've said the term, you know, a rising tide floats all boats. And I think it's fantastic that anybody can take their little, you know, their, their little iPhone or their, you know, whatever and go take a picture. And, and I it, think it's fantastic. Yeah, and personally. so it's adding to the, uh, the, the bottom line. Now, if you're one of those folks who was perhaps, like, it has not gotten easier for a lot of people to make a living, especially the people who are enjoying it cushy. Yes. My question to them, and again, I'm, this is my own slice is what industry in the world stands still for the people in that industry? None. I mean, maybe where there's some really high-end unions that have locked in. But generally speaking, market economies, they move on and they don't sit around and wait. So I'm not sure why photographers, for example, or creatives would think that their industry would wait and that they could still, they could retire on their Getty Images checks from stock images they took in the 1980s. I'm not quite sure that that's a sound, sound argument. So you, you had a question, didn't you? Hey, Norton, would you pass the mic right over here, please? Say who you are and what's your question. I'm Katie Wright. Um, I just wanted to make kinda, sure you put the mic up. There you go. I Thank just you. wanted to kind of play off on what she was saying and kind of just in general, um, like a lot more people can, you know, show off their things and you know everybody's kind of on the same level. But that also comes to a point where. You know, if you're really talented, now you have the opportunity to get out there. And so it does kind of just, you know, separate people because anybody can kind of show off their things now, like on YouTube or whatever. But the really talented people are the ones that are going to kind of, you know, see, go through and make it. But then I also had a question for Mike. Um, where do you kind of go for your inspiration just on a daily basis? Is there like some places that you touch on, just websites or whatever? Um, I get inspired by people and things that are not associated with what I'm doing. I don't know why. It's always been kind of my, the way I, I, I've approached things. Like, um, you know, I mean, throughout my life, I don't mean to pull the Asian card, but like Bruce Lee is a big influence um, because his, his style was kind of a remix because he took all the things that he liked from other other disciplines and said, okay, well, I like how the Thai people kick and I like how, you know, the Brazilians, like, they, they grapple and stuff. So it's like, uh, why, why am I going to constrain myself to one way of doing things when they do all these things so well? I'm a human being. I could, I could do that too. So that's kind of that, that's kind of how I, I think about things. And so if I'm looking at, if I'm editing something, I'm, I'm watching, like, Walter Murch. Like, that guy, he edits standing up. Why does he do that? Because he, he wants to have a rhythm. It's like, uh, of course. Sort of jig. Yeah, yeah you can't you'd be sitting in your chair like, oh, man, this, this is a good remix right here. <laughs> no. Um, so let me like dovetail on that. And, and so when you talked about being an editor, there's Malcolm Gladwell just wrote a piece about Steve Jobs. Mm -hmm. He didn't say Steve Jobs was a brilliant inventor. He said Steve Jobs is one of the best editors our culture has ever seen. So I'm, I, I think and have always thought of Steve as a remixer because he didn't invent the MP3 player. There were, I mean, we were just having this dinner. I had this <laughs> MP3 player years before the, uh, the uh, iPod came out. I had a little MP3 player that, you know, had a, a SD memory card in it. You could, like, you could hold 16 gigs worth of music in a thing that was the size of a, like a, a pile of stamps. But he made it navigable. He made the, he created the music store around it. He, he created a, the, the hard disk that didn't have to have removable memory. So 
all those things were borrowed from other things too. I mean, he, there was some invention in there, the little scroll wheel, I think it was really interesting. But what Jobs is, and, and, and what, like you said, like why would I limit myself to the thing that I know? It's really the thing like, I want the best kickboxer, the, the tie kicker over here, and the mm -hmm. Brazilian grappler, I'm gonna put those things together. I think it's interesting that, what, to follow up on your question, that you try and seek things that are not like most familiar to you as your inspirational material. Yes, constantly learning. Um, and that helps, I mean, just from a technical standpoint, you know, just le learning tricks. Like if that, this guy is really good at uh, Ableton Live and I need to learn some, uh, how to do something in, in that program. It's like, okay, I'll, I'll watch this guy. Oh, he does, okay, that's how he does it, cool. Got it. Um, you just keep. Yeah, a lot, of, a lot of questions coming in online right now. I just had one that was pulled up and uh, erased the, the name of the questioner. Um, so sorry about that, I think his name was Josh. And the question was if a copyright holder came to you and said, you used my stuff in a way that I don't approve of, would you take it down? Uh, yes, I would, and I have. There you um, go. But See, okay, keep going. No problem. But, but then for, for every one of those guys, there's someone like Edgar Wright. I did a Scott Pilgrim remix, and he hit me up in, this, in that <laughs> week, Edgar too. Wright. I was like, this is awesome. He blogged about it, and he, yeah, it was great. Um, so I don't, I don't mind that as much. Some people just don't get it, and that's fine. You're not gonna, I mean, this, that old, you're not gonna please everybody, and you really, you can't, you can try, but right. you're just not gonna, it's just human nature. And it's, it's, again, that's part of, it goes back to the respect thing with the remix, like if you're remixing someone's material and they don't want it to be remixed, oh, absolutely, that's part of the risk that you incur. I just wanna point out the trajectory again of earlier when you were remixing, you know, videos on the internet that you just found that your friends made or that you thought were interesting, and the more you did that, the more well-known you became, and then now, at some point it flips, right? Because now you actually have the rights to display the Favreau's trailer. So at some point, this is sort of the trajectory that, that all of us are aiming for, is that if you do what you do well enough, Steve Jobs' case, Mike Realm's case, that people will, at, at some point, will flip it and make sure that you have the rights because you're doing something of value, adding value. So that's the case, not only do they pay you, but they give you the rights to display it and put it on YouTube and your YouTube channel and all that mm -hmm. stuff, which adds value to them. So for the folks that are toiling in their basement, like all of us are, have been at one point, this is sort of a don't give up moment, right? Because the more you do at a higher quality, the more opportunity there is for that to flip and for you to actually be within the law at some point down the line. Yeah, and be on their side. Um, also, the advantage to me, you know, grinding it out for so many years, um, you know, with, with little to no attention was I got to kind of hone my, my craft. And mm -hmm. so when I do get these things, I'm not like scrambling, like, oh my God, how do I do this? It's like, no, I, I already know, I've been doing that. That's cool. Let's, let's get it done. This is That's what I've been sort of like the, the analogy that I have to make. Also, about you, if you're a pro golfer, you have to be able to hit it down the middle every time. You can't yep. walk up and shank it. So there's this underlying talent. You have to have some skills in order to do this respectfully and, and, and with, in, a, in a mechanism that adds value. I'm going back to the phones here. Um, Arcade Northwest says, is a democratization or flattening of art actually good or does it produce far more average? I would say it produces far more average, yeah. Mm -hmm. I see a lot of that. Yeah, but a again, lot of crappy videos on YouTube. But I feel like it's easier <laughs> for it's easier for you to stand out if everyone is just average. Like, so I, so like, this, is, yeah, this is the comeback, right? Is like, yes, there is more average, but I would say there's a lot more people making stuff and a more creative world is a better world, for one. And for two, what you were going to is like, yeah, but it's easier to stand out then for the people who actually have talent. Yeah, if everyone's doing status quo, it's like we were talking about um, with, with, with like Nirvana, when, when that was happening in like the, the early 90s, Everyone was, was on like metal and, and all that. That was huge. Hair metal, baby. Yeah, that's crazy. Now, if those guys would have said, oh, you know what? That's what everyone's doing. We should do that. Like, we wouldn't have Nirvana. We wouldn't have like Smells Like Teen Spirit and Lithium. And, um, but they, they, Which they that stuff is recorded st very near here, by the way. Yeah, that, that's We're why I that. went to Seattle. A little shout out. Nice, nice. respect, Seattle. <laughs> <laughs> But I, I think that, that that's the same thing for them, is everyone, I want to say metal's average, because people love it, but like that was definitely the, the norm, that was the majority. Mm -hmm. So it was easier for them in that time to, to stand out. 
And a lot of it's timing, right. but you have to be doing what you're doing in order to catch that wave. There's a great, there's a great saying that goes hand in hand with this. I, I shouted this from the mountaintops as long as possible, which is do not try to only be better, try and be different. Because different, in my humble opinion, is far more powerful than incrementally better. Yeah. You know I mean, if your carabiner can, if this particular carabiner, as if for a climber, holds 2,000 kilograms and this next one holds 2,001, is it better? Well, technically, but why not devise an entire new rig, a new ascension rig, or a new, some other rig that completely doesn't end around around this? And that's really what grunge was, right? Mm -hmm. Am I, is my hair just gonna be bigger? Am I gonna be the next poison? <laughs> Am I gonna be makeup. poisoned? Is that really how I'm gonna add to it, you know? No, I'm gonna, I'm gonna make this really raw, raunchy sound that came out of, came out of uh, you know, punk and posies and all these, yeah. and pixies and lots of bands with the peas. <laughs> it does. Uh, cool. So Two Thumbs Fresh says, I'm a game producer and, and user-generated content is becoming an integral part of our industry. Confirm or deny, user-generated content is basically sort of remixed art, is it not? Sure. I think so. All right. Hey, Beretta. What's up, man? Uh, you guys familiar with the band The Glitch Mob? Amazing electronic yeah. band out of, uh, out of Los Angeles. Shout out to you guys. Thank you so much. Um, this sounds exactly like the talk we were having last weekend, Chase. <laughs> which, which it was, which it was. Thanks for being on the show or paying attention. We're going to try and get you guys on the show, by the way. They're amazing. Um, yeah, so, so amazing. Um, questions from the audience? Yes, sir. The green glasses. By the way, I love those glasses. Those are a remix of Kermit the Frog and Varnay's. <laughs> I love it. Bring it home. And I think they would run you $4 at a stand by the beach. There you go. Instead of Varnay's, it would be 400 right? So exactly. What, what you were just saying also made me think of the, what it can bring to the corporate world. Uh, for example, the shoes I'm wearing now I, uh, are Mi Adidas. You can go on Adidas site um, and make your own, design your own shoes. They offer you some choices. Make the shoe look however you want. And they're kind of running that remix from the corporate perspective because they can see making what you want enables you to do that. Do you see that available? Do you see that as an avenue for things to be done legally and for the um, copyright holders or the other people that are making these things available to everybody to uh, monetize sounds bad, but know, you know, fair. in that sense, to, to be able to flex it that way and offer consumers something else in that remix style. Um, yeah, so so um, like, uh, is, it, is it good for commerce? I mean, in a I nutshell, it, like, is, is it, yeah, when, when, when major brands are, is, is it legit for major brands to tap into remix culture and in the name of making money? Or is it only like super, super rad hipsters with like jeans that are even tighter than mine? <laughs> no, I, I think it's great that they're going that way. And, and I think it's not so much that the, the product is a literal remix, but the way they thought about it is, you know, they're, they're, like we make shoes, cool. Um, how do we change the way we present them or sell them? Um, that, that in itself is a remix, the way they, they, they change that model. Because it's like, yeah, everyone goes to whatever, Foot Locker, whatever you, wherever you buy shoes at the mall, and it's like, okay, you can, Trademarked. <laughs> you can pick from like <laughs> five different shoes. If you're not happy, then you go on Zappos. And, and you know, now I just go to Zappos and, and, and cut, the, cut the trip to the mall. But, um, and that, that's a brilliant way to, to get that um, and to justify people going to the website. And, and I think, yeah, more than, I, w I wouldn't call the, yeah, again, I wouldn't call the, the, the shoe itself a remix. It's more customized, but the right. way of thinking is yeah, the, the for sure thinking remix. and the pattern of thinking, I think that the way I look at it is, again, it's a new style of thinking and does it add value? So yes, it's a new style of thinking because otherwise they had a catalog that they printed out early that was they can get these 10 shoes this season and then you went and you bought it. So it's a new style of thinking because it's not in that line. And two, it's completely like the, the ability for us to make something of our own is and, and enabling that in the name of Adidas is trying to make money. Do I fault them for it? Do you guys hate Adidas for that or do you appreciate it? Yeah, you appreciate it. So again, that's something of, of being able to add value. So there's another tweet coming in from My Visual Poetry. With technology involving every sec evolving every second, how do you keep your mindset future-proof 
as to not fade away into irrelevance. That sounds so sad. Yeah. How <laughs> <laughs> fading away. Fading away. Well, I have an answer, but I want yours. Um, how do you future-proof you know, yourself? That's an interesting way to think about it. I don't know. I, I just, and what I've always done is just to follow your, it sounds so stupid, follow your, your, your passion, your, you know, if, if, it might not be remixes next year or whatever, but like, I want to be working on stuff that I like. So at the, you know, it might not be uh, financially future-proof, but at least it'll be like me future-proof. I'll, I'll love what I'm doing. And I'm, that's, Boom. I'm so lucky for that. That's the key. So can you ever be future-proof? No, that's why they call it the future. <laughs> <laughs> because you don't know what the future brings. So to make yourself financially future-proof is even more absurd because we don't know what markets are going to bear. Imagine, I, I, and there's a lot of the audience as photographers there. So for the photographers out there that, that thought that you were going to be able to retire on your Getty images and your Corbis checks and just sail around and take pictures of your feet by the pool, like, you know, you got a, you got a rude awakening, right? And I'm, look at, I, I was enjoying that benefit. But the point is, to, I think, to shift gears and, and not to whine about it because my early reference, no market stands still. So financially, we're not future-proof. But I buy in very, very deeply and wholeheartedly with what Mike is saying is that, hey, look, it, if you are always making what you want to make, the money finds you. And I, I guess I'm going to put a little addendum there, an asterisk. If you're <laughs> making what you want and sharing it, then money finds you. Because if you're in your own basement and you're hanging your pictures on the wall and no one sees them, it's hard to get paid, discovered. Um, shared, etc. So that's why I have this sort of create, share, sustain um, kind of mantra that uh, that I have employed for my professional career. And the sustain part of it is like you know if you got to wait tables on the side, or if you got to take, you know, jobs that are maybe not your favorite, but you're still getting sure. paid. If you got to spend a few weddings or in, in your yeah. world, whatever it is. But if you're always following this passion, then you, I think, by default, avoid irrelevance. No way to future proof unless you're following your passion. Yep, I agree. So keep questions coming. They're pouring in now a little bit faster than I can get to them. But uh, we've got two, one in the front row here, good sir. We'll bring the mic over to you in just a second, and then we'll follow up right in the back row back there. We'll start up here up front. Norton, boom. Thank you, sir. Uh, so we're talking about stealing videos and music, but do you ever steal style? And how do you uphold the integrity of that? Like an example is like Skrillex, you know, he started with the different tweaks and stuff and then everybody mm -hmm. started, you know, taking those tweaks and do you ever do that? Like, um, no, I, I definitely, is that, that's biting. That's like, that's the, biting. Yeah. That'd be if I, if I took like a, like a glitch mob track, love the glitch mm -hmm. mob, but I'm not going to put their track in my computer and, and try to break it down and try to remake what they've already made. Cause what's the point? Right. Like they, they've already done it. Um, <laughs> probably better than you're going to do. Yeah, know that, right? because I'm the guy who's trying, you know, I'm probably spending 80 times as long trying to imitate and trying to figure out how they did it. I'm just not good at that backwards engineering, but um, I, you, you get influence no matter what. Right. Even influence, if you're into a bad I think, song. influence is the thing that you want to absorb, but then to go and try and make the glitch mob track in a different key. Or, yeah. <laughs> or, or, or with a different instrument, with, you know, it's like, and calling it your own. That's the biting aspect of it that I think is, it's, that's the disrespectful part. To, to be influenced by like, wow, I love that he uses these types of models for his shoots or these characters for her movies or, um, you know, this instrument. I'm going to go look inside myself because that's where 95% of the answers are for the creative soul. And then that's what I'm going to put out. So that, I think that's a great question, a really, really interesting distinction. I like it. Um, let's go to the back row. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Hey, can't what's see going on? There. there you go. Hi. So um, is it possible, rather than thinking of uh, remix as theft or stealing, to reframe it maybe as an invitation to spark a creative conversation? As in, someone puts something out there, I hear it, and this is how I filter it through you, myself you, and send it back. I'm going to put you up on the couch. I'm going to go stand in the <laughs> audience. That's beautiful. Do, do, you, do you see that as something that maybe you've been, like, have you entered that sort of dialogue with someone? At first, it was, it was that, for sure, because that, that's, that's all I could do. I, wasn't, I didn't have an audience to, to talk to. It was more like, okay, well, 
a couple people might see this and that's great and it'll help them talk about the movie, which is, is kind of the, the, the point of it. Um, but now it's a little different because I, I've gotten to a different point in my career, but early on for sure. It's a, yeah, That's it's how it a, should it's be. A conversation, and it's a conversation starter. Like this is, um, I, I go back to the photographer Richard Prince. I don't know how many of you are familiar with Richard Prince's work, but Richard Prince took a photograph of a photograph, and it was one of the first images. His Richard's was one of the first images to sell for a million dollars. So this is a photograph of a photograph, which is about as a direct of a ripoff as you can make, right? It was a photograph, if I'm not mistaken, of the Marlboro Man part of a Marlboro commercial, so there was a consumer part, and then he was a non-commercial, or he was a commercial, like a, the ad is a commercial, right? So he took a photograph, a non-commercial photograph that was a fine art piece, and he's making commentary about that particular piece. The reason Richard Prince did that in the 70s, if he were here I would ask him, but I'm gonna have to, to take a stab, and what I know about it is that he, he was making a statement that all these other folks, Grandmaster Flash and some of these, you know, some of the folks coming out of, of Jamaica, they're sampling, yet us photographers, we can't sample. So he took the most extreme example as he could. And what did it do? It sure as hell started a conversation. So it's not the same conversation that you were referencing, I think, in that, hey, I'm going to build on this and then you're going to send something cool back to me. But it's just another layer, a meta, if you will, of the conversations that can happen. Certainly, I mean, that ended up poorly for him because he was sued. But, but the point of having it be a conversation, a, a relevant pop culture thing that photographers were trying to play a part of this, Cindy Sherman does the same thing in, in some cases. So it's a pattern that we see, and I think conversation at, 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 the, at the gut of it is, is the most important part. Because here we are having a conversation. There's, I don't know if there's lawyers in the room or there's probably plenty watching out there. Uh, they haven't been able to lock this down. It's very case by case basis. So conversation continues. I'm just trying to get some clarity so the rest of us can go out there and make some cool shit. Because at the end of the day, we want to, that's Lessig's point, is that we don't want to be f feared of making stuff, right? We want to be able to, to go out and create freely and add value. Given the copyright law, it's really, really difficult for us. We have 35 minutes remaining. We wow. know we got to have 30 minutes for you to do your thing. So there's a couple. I wanted to play a couple other um, little bits of your work. Okay. One that I laughed my <laughs> off when I first time I saw it. I don't know. I, I follow you very closely on Twitter. So um, it was the Old Spice remix. So you guys all know the, the Old Spice guys. So this is another example, if I'm not mistaken, and we'll, we'll get to this in just a second, of they loved what you did, right? Yeah. Okay. It was a, it was a Before, don't go there. I'm going to go. Okay. They loved what you did. We're going to go there. And if you've got it queued <laughs> up, let's, uh, we're going to need to turn the volume up on that guy right there. And boom. How can I smell like space shuttles? That's easy. Hello. <laughs> Hello. Space known to man. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so good. I love that. That's amazing. So Thanks. I, what I, I, I teased that at the beginning, like, so you just made that, and then what happened? Um, they, the, the people who were in charge of making it, well, loved it. So they hit me up too. <laughs> like, we love this because they were aware of what was going on. It was a so if you steal your shit, thing. you're going to get a phone call from the maker and they're always going to love it is what you take away. Always. From just so, no, just be careful. do it. I don't want to get a pattern here, but I think that's really, really, really interesting. That, yeah. that, and, and are you making more of that stuff now? Or are you like on their um, team? Or are you guys like... 
No, I mean like not not. They just like gave you a high five. Right? It was it was definitely a high five, but I liked that because I, I admired what they were doing, and again it was something that I, I liked. I was following the 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 live. Um, you know, he's answering the questions and stuff. I was like, this is really interesting. This is awesome. Like, I want to be a part of this somehow. I love that, too. I want to be a part of this somehow. Like, that's a way for you to be a part of a relevant conversation. And there's, you can really seize uh, the, like, the day-to-day -day internet memes and be a part of a conversation. That's sure. why on YouTube, you, you can, can read it all day. Re repost a video about this video uh, as an example. That's, as you said, you'd rather do something that you didn't just make in a minute, but you made in a, in a week or a month. But that's, again, trying to add value. Because if you're just making something you can turn around in two minutes, then it's not adding. Or by default, it's going to be hard to add that much value. Um, let's see. You need to stay there for just a second, because I'm going to go back to you, Norton. And I want to, <laughs> the Glitch Mob. So we're in a great conversation with the Glitch Mob. <laughs> and I love you guys. And uh, would you guys clap if you want the Glitch Mob to be on this show in the future? There you go. The internet has spoken, so we're going to get that trio up here. Um, and what they've said, this is going to be, this is beautiful. Tell Mike we stole his idea when we remixed the Tron Daft Punk trailer, <laughs> and then Disney called us and made it official. Very good. There you go. And that right? was an awesome remix, too. Yeah, that was an awesome remix. Oh, so man. again, let's, let's find a way to explore this scary ground in a way that's safe, that benefits culture and benefits society. I am in no way advocating. I make my life based on the intellectual property that I create. I am in no way trying to undermine my, my living. I'm trying to push culture forward and say it might get more difficult for me. I have to, might, be, might have to be more inventive. But let's celebrate this opportunity. Now, speaking of celebration, if we may, you have a live performance coming up. I do. You do have a live performance. I'm ready. And so, we're gonna do a little shift here. Um, remember to keep retweeting anything that you've heard because we're gonna, at the end of the show, we're gonna pick that which we like the best. We're gonna give away another Polaroid Z340. Where are you, Polaroid? You're right here, Polaroid Z340. I dropped it right here. This bad boy instant digital camera, which is a printer and a digital camera at the same time. It's freaking awesome. Great fun at parties. We're gonna give away one of those. We're gonna give away a signed Polaroid that I shoot of Mike after the show. For you to, again, favorite quote, CJ Live, and URL to this show, and you are performing, which is about to be live. the dopest thing, live. So for the folks that are watching live, we're going to go to one of my favorite videos of yours that you directed with Dell the Funky Homo Sapien, which I don't know if you guys know Dell. That guy's a legend, and you had some great stories about <laughs> Dell last night, um, which you, you'll have to tell these folks later in private. Sure. Um, and so that video is called Every Time. And we're going to now cut to this. So for the folks that are at home, we're going to give you, actually, so the live, sorry, let me back up. The live audience, if you're watching right now, you are stoked. Because you're going to get to watch this video called Every Time, which features Mike directing Del the Homo Sapien on vocals. The Funky Homo Sapien. Uh, yes. Yeah. Is that what I say? Del the Funky Homo Sapien uh, on vocals and your music underneath it. And if you are, Rewatching this at some like three weeks from now, that's going to be your little nugget. We're going to we're going to let you watch that video, and if you're watching live, you get to watch that watch that video and Mike's performance. Boom! Do that one more time. That was very tasteful. Yes, <laughs> lovely. So the questions can keep coming in. We're going to take care of our questions, and I want to again thank Broncolor, thank B and H, thank Polaroid for supporting the show. Uh, I can't be happier. And if you're watching this, blah blah blah. I think I got everything here. One of a kind signed Polaroid. Shall we cut to the screen and do our little transform here? All right, signing off.
just a cloudy dream And my wallet's hanging out of my jeans Missing cream Every time you break my Pressure and fools to get them to do anything you in the mood to do. Food with a view, a movie review. Yeah, table for two, bagels and brew. At the microbrewery, plus bars of jewelry. Two of each diamond studded designs and nuggets. I tried to love ya, but your mind was rubbish. With your mind on a husband with a mansion lined with hundreds. Crime and punishment, blind and wondering where you been. Now I'm just thinking out loud. See the next chapter.